My subject is the holiness movement. Now, we might wonder where this movement came from and how it began, especially when we consider the size that the movement has grown into. According to 2015 statistics, there is a combined number of 600 million adherents. Now, that's broken down into three separate groups, holiness churches themselves, classical Pentecostals, and assorted charismatics. The holiness movement involves a set of beliefs and practices which chiefly emerged out of the 19th century Methodism movement, that is, Wesleyan Arminian in theology, and is defined by the doctrine of a second work of grace. The holiness people taught that the second work of grace or second blessing referred to a personal experience following regeneration, commonly called salvation, in which the believer is cleansed of a tendency to commit sin. This experience of entire sanctification, or perfectionism as it is sometimes called, was to enable the believer to live a holy life. So let's consider the foundation of the holiness movement. John Wesley, of course, is the pioneer of the holiness movement. Wesley was the founder of Methodism, but he was also the spiritual and intellectual father of the holiness and Pentecostal movements which have issued from Methodism. Wesley was the son of an Anglican clergyman. He was educated at Oxford. He took Anglican orders in 1728. Wesley's early days of theological study led him in a pursuit of holiness of heart and life. He followed the writings of Jeremy Taylor, Thomas Akempis, and William Law's book, Treatise on Christian Perfection and a Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. Greatly influenced by William Law's writings, John and his brother Charles founded the Holy Club in 1729 at Oxford University in England. Highly motivated by the idea of living a strict and holy life, Wesley departed England for America. Wesley began a work in Savannah, Georgia in 1735 as a missionary to the Indians. However, Wesley did not meet with the success that he had hoped for. He found the Indians, as well as the colonists, highly resistant to religious reform. So discouraged, he returned to England in 1737. However, on his trip home, Wesley encountered a Moravian preacher, Peter Bowler, from Germany. It was Peter Bowler that actually influenced Wesley's theology. He influenced his thinking in respect to a person having a personal encounter with Christ through faith and repentance rather than conforming to High Church of England ritualism. Later on, at a small religious meeting at Aldersgate Street, London, on May 24, 1738, John Wesley claimed to have had an experience in which he said his heart was strangely warmed. After this spiritual conversion, which centered on the realization of salvation by faith in Christ rather than salvation by religious formalism, he devoted his life to evangelism. By 1740, Wesley's ideas on theology were fairly well cast in the permanent mold that would shape the Methodist movement. Simply stated, they involved two separate phases of experience for the believer. First, conversion or justification, and secondly, Christian perfection or perfectionism or sanctification, it was called. When Methodism came to America, the doctrine of entire sanctification came along with it. It came with strong preaching. The first Methodist preacher to come to America was a man by the name of Captain Thomas Webb. He was a military man. He had a patch over one eye and normally preached in his military uniform. He actually preached the first recorded Methodist sermon in this nation in 1766. 
Francis Asbury, another strong preacher, came to America. He traveled an average of 5,000 miles a year on horseback. It was said that Asbury was as firmly committed to the doctrine of holiness as Wesley was. Richard Wright was another strong preacher. He was a key figure in bringing the message of sanctification and total commitment to Christ. It was stated by historians that in these meetings they were amazing. It was recorded that many would be groaning for pardon because they were so convicted of their sins. Others could be heard entreating God with strong cries and tears to save them from sin. Some wept with grief and others shouted with joy. These were emotional meetings, but they claimed to be highly effective. These people, it was said, changed their lives for Christ and their way of living. By 1776, half of all the Methodists in America were in Virginia where much of the drunkenness, cursing, swearing, and fighting which had characterized the colony before the revival gave way to a time of prayer and praise and people conversing and talking about God. This revivalistic outbreak was the first instance of a Pentecostal-like religious revival in the nation. One Anglican clergyman in a later observation stated that as the emotional element abated, the work of conviction and conversion abated too. As time went on, there was, of course, a decline of the holiness movement. It was a cooling off period. There would come a loss of passion, of zeal, and commitment. Within a decade of 1800, the revival movement that had characterized the passionate worship of earlier times became more institutionalized. The climax of revival in America with a holiness emphasis came in 1858. This year would also mark the last religious awakening preceding the Civil War. In 1858, the awakening was primarily urban and northern. The South uh, saw very little the impact of the revival of 1858. Long before 1858, the Southern churches had largely abandoned the quest of holiness in theory and in practice. The Southern churches no longer stressed or preached perfectionism or sanctification. As the nation drifted towards war, the shift in thinking also uh, became different, political and secular. However, in time, there would come a reawakening of holiness principles. The first region in the United States to experience a religious revival after the war was the South. There was a call that went out for a return to holiness principles and the restoration of the old camp meetings. In 1870, the bishops of the Southern Methodist Church again called for a re-emphasis of sanctification. They stated, nothing is so much needed at the present time throughout all these lands as a general and powerful revival of spiritual holiness." Those in the Methodist Church who were interested, they formed an association called the National Camp Meeting Association for the Promotion of Christian Holiness. Meetings began in various states and various places. There was the opening of the Vineland, New Jersey Camp Meeting a historic meeting, and some have said that it was the beginning of the modern holiness crusade. Uniquely, the meeting was interdenominational in scope and was attended by Presbyterian, Baptist, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Friends, and Methodist ministers. Little did these organizers realize that in time, over a hundred denominations around the world would come out of this. Also, there would be a third force in Christendom as well, the Pentecostal movement. Well, the die was cast. 
And once again, strong preaching became the order of the day. Various meetings and camp meetings began to take place and were held across the nation. Thousands attended. From 1867 to 1883, a total of 52 national camps were held mostly on Methodist campgrounds and in connection with Methodist annual conferences. But these were greatly attended and, and people came with a passionate desire, the desire and the interest of the people to see a change in their churches and in America as well is completely amazing. These religious groups at the time showed a remarkable interest in spiritual matters. Scores of holiness denominations began after 1894. Most of them began in the Midwest and in the South. It was said never before in the history of the nation had so many churches been founded in so short of time. Some of these were more balanced groups and more balanced churches, simply advocating holy living and complete dedication to Christ. On the other hand, others were more radical, pushing the envelope of emotionalism to the extreme. Over time, there would come a division in the holiness movement over these issues. The traditional holiness movement is distinct from the Pentecostal movement which believes that the baptism in the Holy Spirit involves supernatural manifestations such as speaking in unknown tongues. Most of the early Pentecostal, Pentecostals originated, of course, from the holiness movement. And to this day, many classical mainline Pentecostals maintain much of the holiness doctrine of the past and many of its devotional practices. Some of its denominations include the word holiness in their names, such as the Pentecostal Holiness Church and the Congregational Holiness Church, to name a couple. Well, the terms Pentecostal and apostolic, now used by adherents to Pentecostal and charismatic doctrine, were once widely used by holiness churches in order to describe a consecrated lifestyle that they saw in the New Testament. During the Azusa Street Revival, the practice of speaking in tongues was strongly rejected by leaders of the traditional holiness movement. One of the more radical groups that paved the way for Pentecostalism was the Fire Baptized Holiness Church. The founder of the church was B. H. Irwin. The Fire Baptized Holiness Church served as an important link in the chain that later produced the modern Pentecostal movement by teaching that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was an experience separate from and subsequent to sanctification. It laid the basic doctrinal premise of the later movement. It is probable that Charles Parham, the man who initiated the Pentecostal revival in Topeka, Kansas in 1901, received from Irwin, with whom he was associated in several meetings before 1901, the basic idea of a separate baptism of the Holy Spirit following sanctification. At this point, I should clarify something about the use of the word fire, which was often employed with the early holiness groups. It comes from a misinterpretation of John's messianic declaration that he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, Matthew 3.11. At first, with the early holiness groups, the fire represented a burning or purging out of any remaining sin. In time, however, it was associated more with zeal, enthusiasm, and excitement, the emotional side of their experience. I can remember as a young man the holiness people saying, you've got to have the Holy Ghost and fire, and they put great emphasis on fire. In the testimony services that 
I remember that they had. Each person always, almost always, ended their testimony with a statement. And you, I'm so glad to have the Holy Ghost and fire, to be saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, to them, it wasn't enough to claim to have Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit Himself. No, you had to have the fire, the zeal, the enthusiasm as well. This, of course, is an unfortunate misunderstanding of the text. It's a clear case of what is called eisegesis, reading into the text, putting something into the verse that the original writer never intended. So to pick back up where we were, Charles Parham had an association with the Fire Baptized Wholeness Church prior to 1901. And there's no doubt that this association had a profound influence on Parham's theology. So as we consider the rise of the Pentecostal movement, we have to consider this key figure, Charles Parham. Who was this man? Well, among the many Americans concerned about holiness and spiritual power at the turn of the century was Charles Fox Parham. Born in Iowa in 1873, Parham spent much of his life in eastern Kansas, where he began preaching in 1889. In 1890, Parham entered Southwest Kansas College and for three years he struggled with his studies and what he believed to be a call to preach. It was Parham who first singled out glossolalia as the only evidence of one's having received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I think it's also important for me to explain that the terms Holy Spirit baptism or being filled with the Spirit or receiving the Spirit are all used interchangeably in Pentecostal and charismatic circles. Parham taught that spirit baptism should be a normal part of the Christian life or worship rather than a curious byproduct of religious enthusiasm. It was his teaching that laid the doctrinal and experimental foundations of the modern Pentecostal movement. It was Parham's ideas preached by his followers that produced the Azusa Street Revival of 1906 and the Pentecostal movement. Parham had begun his ministerial career in Linwood, Kansas as a supply pastor in the Methodist Church. It was the Methodists that he had received the teaching of entire sanctification as a second work of grace an experience which he claimed to have received, and he preached in the Methodist Church. In time, Parham came in contact with some of the more radical elements of the holiness movement, and after much study, had adopted the doctrine of faith healing, as well as other doctrines, as part of the atonement. As earlier stated, he had also been in services with Irwin's fire-baptized people and had rejected the extreme emotionalism, but not the idea of a third experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Actually, by 1895, Irwin had already constructed the doctrine of a third blessing for those who had already been sanctified. This was the baptism of the Holy Ghost and with fire, or simply the baptism of fire. This would be the endowment of power from on high through the Holy Spirit. So by 1900, Parham's theology had come from many sources. Just prior to the opening of the Topeka School, he had traveled to Chicago to hear Alexander Dowie, from there, he had gone to Nyack, New York to hear A.B. Simpson of the Christian and Missionary Alliance and to Shiloh, Maine to investigate Stanifer's Holy Ghost and Us Church. In October 1900, Parham started a school which he named Bethel Bible School near Topeka, Kansas.
By December 1900, Parham had led his students through the study of the major tenets of the holiness movement, including sanctification, divine healing, and the premillennial return of Christ. Parham's long fascination with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit resulted in an assignment for his students to discover biblical evidences for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. By this time, Parham had already separated the second definite work of grace from the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Rather than stressing two crisis experiences, he was moving in the direction of teaching three definite stages, conversion, sanctification, and spirit baptism. After completing their assignment, Parham's students agreed that the baptism in the Holy Spirit clothed the believer with power for service. They also agreed that the biblical evidence of such baptism was always speaking in tongues. Parham believed that the doctrine of spirit baptism ev evidence by tongues meant the apostolic faith had been fully recovered. At this point, I think it's important to note that there were others that had already experienced speaking in tongues prior to 1901, prior to Parham's groups. A man by the name of Edward Irving, a Presbyterian minister in Scotland in the early 1800s. After studying the book of Acts, he began to teach his congregation that what the early church experienced was to be the norm for the church in his day. And after preaching such a lesson, on March 28, 1830, a Miss Mary Campbell, one of his members, began to speak in other tongues. One group in Texas around 1883 was already teaching a third work following sanctification called the fire. Members of the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, had spoken in tongues in the 1896 revival. At the time, they still called themselves the Christian Union, but they still referred to themselves unofficially as the Church of God. There were others, various camp meetings and revivals and groups that had had similar experience. The difference is that none of these groups were teaching that speaking in tongues was the evidence of spirit baptism. Well, convinced that his conclusion was a proper interpretation of scriptures, Parham and his students conducted a watch night service on December 31st, 1900, which was to continue into the new year. In this service, a student named Agnes Osman requested Parham to lay hands on her head and to pray for her to be baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. It was after midnight and the first day of the new year, 1901, when Miss Osman began to speak in tongues. This event is commonly regarded as the beginning of the modern Pentecostal movement in America. However, I also discovered a little known fact concerning Ms. Osman. She too had the prior association with the Fire Baptized Holiness Church. She had traveled around and been in various meetings with different holiness groups prior to her attending Parham's Bible School. My point is this. You, you will find that all these individuals or groups to have spoken in tongues as they claim, first had the idea psychologically induced to them in some way. It didn't just happen to any of these individuals or groups like it did to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. Jesus never psychologically induced the idea of speaking in tongues in relationship with Holy Spirit baptism. He spoke to them of the promise of the Father in Acts 1 and 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They questioned him about the kingdom being restored to Israel, of which Jesus told them they didn't need to know anything about that at that time. But then he said in Acts 1.8, 
But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Not one mention about speaking in tongues in connection with Holy Spirit baptism. Well, in the days that followed, all the students, as well as Parham, claimed to have received this experience of speaking in tongues. This created a stir in the community. Soon newspaper reporters were there recording the events. The Topeka Capitol reported in headlines, A Queer Faith, Strange Acts, Believers Speak in Strange Languages. Well, a remarkable claim that they made during these meetings was that they all spoke in known languages. Twenty-one, they claimed. Well, taking these events at face value, Parham immediately began to teach that missionaries would no longer need to study foreign languages to preach in the mission fields. And the truth of the matter is, if all these claims were true, if the tongues were real, if it was the real Holy Spirit working, then Parham would have been right. No missionary with this gift would ever need to go to a language school. Well, with the notoriety of these events, Parham and some of his students held meetings in various places, Galena, Kansas, and in Missouri. After the meetings in Missouri in 1901, Parham closed his school at Topeka and he began a whirlwind tour of revivals which lasted for four years. By the fall of 1905, he moved his headquarters to Houston, Texas at the request of some friends who believed as he did. He found a large three-storied house where he started another Bible school that he called it simply the Bible Training School. In Parham's short-term Bible school, the teachings covered the subjects of conviction and repentance, conversion, consecration, sanctification, healing, the Holy Spirit, prophecies, and revelation. It's important for us to realize that Parham's theology was basically self-made. He believed the Holy Spirit communicated with him directly. So it was not hard to see how his theology was riddled with doctrinal heresies. He believed in annihilationism, denying the Bible doctrine of eternal torment. He believed in the unscriptural doctrine of Anglo-Israelism. He taught that there were two separate creations, a pre-Adamic race, that Adam and Eve were of a different race, than people who allegedly lived outside the Garden of Eden, and that this first race of people did not have souls. He claimed that this race of unsold people was destroyed in the flood. He believed that those who received the spirit baptism and spoke in tongues would make up the bride of Christ and would have a special place of authority at Christ's return. So we can see that the foundation for religious confusion had already been laid prior to Azusa Street. Among the students uh, was a black holiness preacher by the name of William J. Seymour. In the spring of 1906, Seymour received an invitation to preach for a black holiness congregation, the Church of the Nazarene on Santa Fe Street in Los Angeles. Seymour took as his text Acts 2 and verse 4 and declared that speaking in tongues was the initial evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit, although at the time he had not received the experience. The pastor, a Mrs. Hutchinson, feeling that this teaching was contrary to accepted holiness views, padlocked the church door the next night to keep Seymour out although most of her members already enthusiastically accepted this message. Now, it wasn't long before meetings were being held at an old abandoned Methodist church building at 312 Azusa Street. 
This old two-story building was by 1906 in shambles. And one historian said, a visitor to Azusa Street during the three years that the meetings continued would have been shocked and amazed. A bewildered Los Angeles Times reporter visited the meetings and remarked, the night was made hideous by the howlings of the worshipers. Men and women would shout, weep, dance, fall into trances. There were fits and spasms, jerks and shakes. Well, in true Quaker fashion, anyone who felt moved by the Spirit, as they called it, would preach or sing or do anything. There was absolutely no order to the services. No one was really in charge, not even Seymour. Well, the lack of order at these Azusa Street services opened the door, as you can imagine, to various religious antics. It wasn't long before spiritualists and mediums from numerous occult societies of Los Angeles began to attend and to contribute their seances and trances to the services. When Parham, who had been invited to come early on, finally arrived at Azusa Street, he was shocked at what he found. In his words, he said, To my utter surprise and astonishment, I found conditions even worse than I had anticipated. I saw manifestations of the flesh, spiritualistic controls, people practicing hypnotism at the altar over people seeking the baptism. Parham described the Azusa Street tongues as chattering, jabbering, and sputtering, speaking no language at all. The Azusa Street meetings were so wild that Parham condemned them with the term sensational holy rollers. He also referred to men and women kneeling together that would sometimes fall across one another in a morally compromising manner. According to Parham, two-thirds of the people professing Pentecostalism in his day were either hypnotized or spook-driven. It is amazing when you think about it. Even Parham himself, with all the strange doctrines that he taught and believed, could see that what was taking place at Azusa Street was far from anything godly or Christ-exalting. In conclusion, what can be said? Well, things that I learned from this. Number one, and that is that passion for God is a good thing, and it's always needed in every generation of the church. Secondly, men are always needed who are not afraid to proclaim God's Word and to preach the whole counsel of God. And thirdly, in every generation, there's always a danger that the church will gravitate to one extreme or the other. It can become cold and indifferent with ritualism, or it can become radical, given to sensationalism. And then fourthly, it is the responsibility of every generation to be faithful custodians of the truth and to pass it along unaltered, unspoiled, untarnished, and fully intact to the next generation. We owe them that. Holy Word.